If you're a lonely, doomer-pilled troglodyte who spends a lot of time staring at Tinder Talk, Bumblegram, or Grinder Hub, then you've probably heard this album in your head, even if you haven't with your ears. The Ghost Pop Tape by Devon Hendrix is probably the most accurate depiction of crumbing in audio form, and if you don't know what that means, I'm not going to explain it. Devon Hendrix was a very mysterious and obscure artist before being picked up by the Joint Photographic Experts Group Mafia, or Peggy for short. Growing up poor in Flatbush, Alabama, and eventually Louisiana, he joined the Air Force to escape his economic situation, where he was stationed in Iraq, Germany, Kuwait, and perhaps most importantly for his music career, Japan. He'd been producing rap beats ever since he was a kid, but it was during his time in Japan that he began releasing music under the name Devon Hendrix inspired by his birth certificate. Despite his work from this era of his career being largely ignored at the time and still overlooked by much of his fan base, I'd argue that it still holds a lot of significance for being as ahead of its time as it was. Projects like the Rockwood Escape Plan and especially Joe Chill World have really cool uses of samples that fall in line with the whole vaporwave thing, but seamlessly put into the context of hip-hop with charismatic lyrics about how annoying Eminem stands are and liking girls who like girls who like men. But of course, the most cutting edge and important work he made during this time was a little album called Dreamcast Summer Songs, baby! Recorded all the way back from 2007 to 2009, Dreamcast Summer Songs consists of six instrumental tracks that are each named after and inspired by a Sega Dreamcast game. Its nostalgic, sample-based compositions have led a lot of people to label it as the first ever Vaporwave album, as it predates a lot of records that are looked at as the building blocks for that genre. However, the album was tweaked and re-released a few times from 2009 to 2012, even taking up the name Since I Left You 2 at one point making its actual release date a hot-button political issue in the Vaporwave community. I kind of think it has more in common with older sample-based records than it does Vaporwave anyway, but regardless of all of that, I'd highly recommend giving this thing a listen. It'll make you feel like you're sitting crisscross applesauce in front of your old CRT playing Dreamcast at 3 in the morning while snuggled up under your Maya and Miguel bedsheets, even down to the noise of the disc reader. <laughs> The one project from this era that everyone seems to agree exists is the Ghost Pop tape from 2013, and that could be because it has the Call Me Maybe cover that is currently his only piece of music from this era available on streaming services, or maybe it's because the cover art's really cool, I don't know. It was originally released as Gen Y the 5th under the name Gen Y the 89th, before being re-released about a month later as the Ghost Pop tape, with some slight adjustments to the track list and mixing. The version currently on Bandcamp has a bunch of bonus tracks, some of which were on Gen Y the 5th, but for the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to be looking at the base album as it was when it was first released as the Ghost Pop Tape. This is by far the darkest and most vulnerable album that Peggy has ever put out, as it was released at a time when he was in a very depressive state, and he's even said that it's a difficult album for him to come back to nowadays. He plans on remastering it and putting it on streaming services soon, but he's been saying that for about a year now, so don't hold your breath. It was released alongside a film of the same name that was so hot I could only find it on X videos, but unfortunately it's not on there anymore and I haven't been able to find it anywhere else. It's kind of like those vaporwave visual albums on YouTube that have fragmented VHS footage from old bumpers and commercials to emphasize the nostalgia in the music, only most of the footage is from weird and obscure that really drive home the loneliness of the album. I can maybe see why he'd want to bury it just for personal reasons, but it's a brilliant work of art that I'd highly recommend if you're able to find it and were alive when Kangaroo Jack came out. There are some music videos for various songs by Devon still up on his old YouTube channel, Joe Chill World, that use the same aesthetics as the visual album, and you can even find a piece of it. These videos all help to paint Peggy's early career as this display of a man who dissociates from his own harsh reality with things like video games, anime, and porn, and nowhere is that more felt than on this album right here. For the first time in the Devon Hendrix catalog, with the exception of Dreamcast Summer Songs, there's barely any rapping at all on this album. In fact, a majority of its 18 tracks don't even feel like fully completed songs on their own so much as they are smaller pieces of a larger whole. 
there's a ton of instrumental detours and hooks that are just loosely floating around without really being attached to anything. Hell, even most of the longer songs don't abide by any conventional structure, helping the listener get immersed into this hopeless and toxically, toxically online, online soundscape. It's a bunch of rough and scattered ideas executed in a smooth and cohesive manner. I understand if people aren't able to resonate with the album because of its structure, but I think everything about it works to give off this feeling of crying while it's rushing off. Oh shit, I explained it. I've heard a lot of people compare this album to Endless by Frank Ocean, and while I don't really hear that many similarities, it does make me think about how the whole alternative R&B thing was relatively new around the time this came out, at least in the public eye, which makes me appreciate it even more. It reminds me more of projects like Echo 2K's Beauty Sleep and James Ferraro's New York City Hell 3 AM, but that's besides the point. Ballad of a Poor Man is one of the most genuinely defeated sounding openings that I've heard to any album in this style. It begins with the sounds of Peggy texting someone before the music creeps in, which helps the listener literally enter his mind. My buddy Jetfire on Instagram said this album sounds like being stuck inside of a depressed iPhone circa 2013, given all of the sound effects that pop up throughout the record, and I think that's a good way of describing this album's vast and empty sound. There's very little going on in this instrumental outside of some sad keyboard notes that sound like they're drowning under the ambience, with the only sense of rhythm coming from this weird breathing noise that cuts in and out. The lyrics sound like spoken lines from a suicide note that are interspersed with this very brief hook, and it's a level of intimacy that I could understand being difficult for Peggy to come back to. I think this track perfectly lays out everything to come, both tonally and structurally, as it's well assembled enough melodically to stick in your head without undercutting any of the emotion. Track 2 is the first of several instrumental interludes, with the only lyrics being the heart emoji. It kind of reminds me of the last few minutes of Kanye's Runaway with how it makes you play the is, is it vocals or, or guitar, guitar game, game, but I think the sound is really cool when placed next to these paranoid sirens in the background. It perfectly transitions into HBK, which happens to to be an interpolation of wrestler Shawn Michaels' sexy boy song. I'm just a sexy boy. I'm not your boy toy. Full disclosure, I actually didn't even know that was the case until I started writing this video, which I think is a testament to how well Peggy was able to completely flip this wrestler's entrance song into something genuinely dark and disturbing. The lyrics paint a picture of being stuck in a toxic and abusive relationship, and using the hook to process that trauma in a way that's more understandable to him. He sounds like he's at the verge of having a complete breakdown throughout the track, with the vocal effects and synthetic instrumental being used to distance the listeners and himself from his own emotions. This idea of trying to understand or escape trauma through the lens of other passions is continued throughout the album, with track titles referencing things like King of Fighters 96, Mugen, and Bubblegum Crisis, just to name a few, and even sampling some of them. Behold a Pale Horse is the first song on the album where Devon is rapping for most of the track, and it also happens to share a name with the Book of Conspiracy Theories by Milton William Cooper. Dude, your references are out of control, everyone knows that. This is one of my absolute favorites on the album, is the the beat maintains the numb and digitized atmosphere while having this slight sense of glitchiness that makes it really catchy and hypnotizing. Peggy's rap flow is actually more relaxed here than it is on most of the material from his previous albums, but he still doesn't hold back on bars about economic and social inequality. Got a white dude going down the street. The song also introduces us to a recurring lyrical motif, stating sex ain't nothing if you can't fit in my ride, which I interpret as him saying that sex is an unfulfilling and fleeting experience because it leads to him feeling more disconnected from the people in his life. This makes later mentions of sex on the album feel very dark and despondent, especially on Porn for Percussion, where the vocals are mixed pretty low behind this thin drum beat and the sounds of heavy breathing. There's not that many lyrics on this song outside of this vague hook that, apart from being genuinely emotional, makes the track feel like a deconstruction of the sexualization in a lot of pop and R&B music. God Bless My Homegirls is kind of similar, but feels the slightest bit more cohesive with its vocal mixing and consistent swapping of the same few hooks that seem to illustrate this cycle of how sex has ruined some of his relationships. 
It begins with enthusiastic thankfulness for the people in his life before lusting after them and then having them feel like another meaningless experience to him. There's one more part thrown in at the end involving his balls going down your lips, so I guess the cycle isn't going to end anytime soon. In fact, it makes the next song feel like an even more numb depiction of sex than what we've already heard so far. We then get Neon Kitchen 4, which if you couldn't tell from the title, is the fourth entry in the Neon Kitchen series. I still haven't figured out the significance of what the Neon Kitchen is referring to or symbolizes, but I like how it adds cohesion between his albums, even if the third one mysteriously isn't on Bandcamp. Hell, the track Untitled 1 from this album is pretty much just an excerpt from Neon Kitchen 2 off of Joe Chill World. There's definitely something at play here. It's probably no coincidence that Neon Kitchen 4 is more reminiscent of his previous works than anything else on this album, with its bouncy rap flow and punchline heavy bars, yet it's still able to maintain the the sprawling ambient production that makes it fit seamlessly. After this is maybe my favorite song in the entire JPEG Mafia canon, which is a cover of Carly Rae Jepsen's Call Me Maybe and holy shit. I'm a sucker for covers that are able to completely change the meaning of the original song without rewriting the lyrics, letting the music speak for itself, and very few other tracks have been able to accomplish that like this one has. Peggy was able to take this bubbly and anthemic pop song and turn it into one of the most bleak depictions of loneliness and sexual deprivation that I've ever heard put into music. He does structure it differently, stacking both verses on top of each other before giving us the hook and closing bridge, which not only makes it fit better in the album, as most of the other songs are structured similarly, but it also does a lot to showcase the underlying darkness of the original track by stripping it of its catchy repetition. The instrumental immediately puts you into this drunken, hazy headspace with this ambience that is constantly shifting back and forth between channels and volume. It was actually made using a sample from the anime Baka and Test, which I haven't watched, but according to Wikipedia, it loosely follows a love triangle between three characters, so there you go. In all seriousness though, the starkness of this instrumental, as well as the slower vocals, turns the adorkable coyness of the original track into something genuinely debilitating. It's like he's trying his best to make a connection with anyone, which works on multiple levels. One, because the lyrics of Call Me Maybe already relate to the topic, and two, the fact that he's covering such a recently popular song, as this cover was released released only a year after it was big, adds another layer of trying to connect with people via something they're already familiar with. The last two and a half minutes or so of this six minute cover are spent with the instrumental slightly progressing into something more melodic and cohesive, with the sounds of a wrestling match going on in the background. I think this is meant to represent him escaping his own head and going back to the reality that he's alone and can only take solace in entertainment. After an interlude titled P-Word number three, we get Bubblegum Crisis, which is another one of my favorites on here. It doesn't have that much to offer lyrically that the rest of the album hasn't already, but it's just a perfect encapsulation of everything I love about this record, from the dreamlike down-tempo beat to the catchy yet dejected vocals. It almost feels like a calming rest stop or checkpoint in the tracklist, despite being pretty much just as bleak as the rest of the album. Maybe it intentionally symbolizes becoming numb to all of the emotions that have built up so far, but I don't know, it's probably just me. Uh, you're already named after the character from Mass Effect, is about being in love with another man, but it's a difficult situation because they both have girlfriends. In fact, he alludes to something similar at the beginning of Porn for Percussion, and given how sexual and internal this album sounds, it makes sense that one of its themes would be exploring his own sexuality, and it's fitting to the visual album as well. I love how vivid and detailed the storytelling on this track is able to be, while still just being a few hooks that are thrown together into this jumbled, dreamy soundscape. The slow yet groovy ambient pop instrumental bleeds into the next song, Oh Superman, which feels like an epilogue to the previous track. The album then wraps up with Untitled 3, which is this tense and frantically spoken word piece that eventually culminates into this large orchestra that plays as our protagonist is committing suicide. Once it's over, we're left with this distant and mysterious beeping noise and the sounds of porn still playing in the background before roughly 10 seconds of silence. Until the bonus tracks start playing. So overall, it's really interesting to look back on how talented and creative this guy was even before anybody knew about him. 
It's kind of a tough listen given how raw and real the emotions are, even when placed into such a creative and forward-thinking body of work, and I can definitely understand why he feels uneasy about re-listening to it. I think his older stuff is every bit as worth appreciating as his recent stuff though, as it doesn't come off as dated despite how old and obscure it is. It's really interesting to see how his career has progressed since this time, and I really hope he's doing better. Thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed, you know the drill. F you see